ただいまより第50回東京財団フォーラムを開催させていただきます、えー、本日は、えー、アメリカにありますジョンズ・ホップキンス大学サイス・ライシャワー東アジア研究所とともに共催いたします1日のシンポジウムの一部を一般公開するという形で東京財団フォーラムを開催させていただいております、えー、今日行う全体のシンポジウムの名前は中央南アジアにおける日米協力シンポジウム2014年以降のアフガニスタンニューシルクロード新大陸主義と題しまして全部で4セッション行う予定ですこのうち開会オープニングリマークスと第一セッションを一般の皆様ともあの分かち合いたいと思いまして東京財団フォーラムとして一般公開させていただきました、えー、昨日まで行われましたアフガニスタンに関する東京会合を受けまして、えー、その会合に参加した政府高官の方々に今日はパネリストとなっていただこうと思っております、えー、早速ですがまずは開会の挨拶といたしまして主催者として東京財団理事長の秋山正弘よりご挨拶させていただきます、えー、おはようございます、えー、今日また朝早くからこんなにたくさんお集まりいただきましてありがとうございます、えー、ご案内の通り昨日東京で、えー、アフガニスタンについての東京会議とこういうものが、実はこれは10年ぶりに東京で<笑>開催されました。アフガニスタン、あるいはそのアジア、そしてアメリカ、ヨーロッパ、世界から有力なその政治指導者が集まりまして、アフガニスタンの復興、あるいは将来の発展、安定のために、大変素晴らしい会議がなされたと思って、ております実はこの今日朝あるいは明日にかけて行いますこのシンポジウムは中央南アジアにおける日米の協力ということについてその議論をするシンポジウムでございます。で実はその東京財団は5年前から東京財団フォーラムと。い,うまあ、いわばシンポジウムをずっと続けておりましてで本日が実は50回目にあたります、えー、何回かご参加いただいた方もいると思いますし実は初めての方もおられるかと思いますが、まあ、正直申し上げますと実は私は初めての参加でございまして東京財団に参加しましたのが理事長に就任いたしましたのが実は2週間ぐらい前でございまして、今、その、なんて言いましょうか、新人として活動している、そしてこの東京財団の公式の会議に挨拶をするのは、今日が初めてでございます。あのこの会議は、まあ、民間ベースといいますか、トラック 1.5 だと思いますけれども、このアジア、特にその中央、南アジアにおける日米協力というタイトルでその議論をしていくという非常に面白い、非常に重要な会議かと思っております。まあ、日米同盟といいますといろいろな問題があります、えーまあ。すぐ日本に参りますと沖縄の問題、オスプレイの問題、まあ、連日ニュースを逃がしておりますけれども、日米協力のあり方として、あるいは日米の同盟の進化として、この中央、あるいは南アジアにおける平和と安定、あるいは特にアフガニスタンについて言えば、その復興といったことについて、日米が協力する、あるいは日米同盟を発揮するというのは、大変面白いそい考え方であろうと思います。私もその同盟関係には非常に興味を持ってこれまでも関わってまいりましたのでこの会議が成功裏に終わることを期待するものでありますこの会議のためにアメリカあるいはアフガニスタンあるいはその関係国からいろいろとその有力な方々がご参加いただいておりますまた日本の政府からは山本大使もご参加いただいております
この席をお借りいたしましてご参加いただいているその政治至上者あるいは政府関係者にその感謝を申し上げたいと思います以上で私のご挨拶にさせていただきますありがとうございましたでは続きまして、共催をしていただいております、ジョンズ・ホープキンス大学の高等国際問題研究院大学院、研究大学院サイズですね、こちらの、えー、来,来社は東アジア研究所から、えー、ケント・カウダー所長に一言いただきたいと思います。It's a pleasure to、uh, be here, and it's an honor today、uh, to be co sponsoring this、uh, conference with the、uh, Tokyo Foundation. Exactly as uh, President uh, Akiyama had said, the、uh, Japan US relationship is certainly something here in Tokyo、uh, that, at least I, having worked previously also with the US government, would want to stress as, as a concern. As we look at a cha changing Asia,、um, there is no question that Asia is changing in some crucial ways, and also that interdependence is rising far beyond、uh, simply the sub regions,、uh, Northeast Asia, East Asia, that we、uh, traditionally look at. The、uh, cent Central Asia, South Asia. Are、uh, changing in very important ways and are also becoming、uh, more integrated、uh, with the broader、uh, continent as a whole. So, the concept of the New Silk Road, continentalism, the ways in which interdependence in economic terms certainly is rising, and the broader implications of this for the region,、uh, for uh, uh, Japan, the United States, and other nations.、Uh, Further removed is, is certainly something that we will be discussing further today.、Um, we have a full day to discuss these things. At this point, I only want to say、uh, thank you to the、uh, Tokyo Foundation, to、uh, President Akiyama,、uh, to so many of the people who have prepared this, to,、uh, the, for the generous financial contribution. Of the UN Development Program and the Asian Development Bank toward the organization of this symposium.、Um, also, of course,、uh, I'd like to extend a personal word of thanks to、uh, my colleague,、uh, Dr.、Uh, Fred Starr, and the、uh, Central Asia Cauc Caucasus Institute uh, at, uh, in Washington, D.C.,、uh, at Johns Hopkins University. So,、uh, with that, Thank you very much for coming, and、um, I look forward, as I think we all do, uh, to uh, the rest of the conference. Your Osh Koning Ai Tashin. So, now I'm going to start with the first one. 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 I'm going to start with アフガニスタン、パキスタン支援担当より、えー、昨日の会議の様子なども含めてお考えを聞かせていただきたいと思います。よろしくお願いいたします。Well, good morning,、uh, everybody.、Um... And、thank you very much for inviting uh, uh, myself、uh, on behalf of the Japanese government to this、uh, very important symposium on New Silk Road.、Um, we, as was、uh, introduced by、uh, President Akiyama, had、uh, what we believe satisfactory, if I may say,、uh, meeting on the、uh, development of Afghanistan into the future in Tokyo. Um, you may know that this is the second of the large international conference that the government of Japan hosted in the field of de development of Afghanistan. The first being in January of 2002, just after the Taliban uh, regime uh, had collapsed. And that actually launched the international、uh, assistance. 
uh, towards Afghanistan in large measure. And so, if you like, the, the effort to create new Afghanistan. And since then, it's already 10 years. And we have made a lot of progress, but have still much to do. And so we hosted the second of this uh, large international conference uh, on the development of Afghanistan. And 55 countries and 25 international and regional organizations came, and at very high levels. But this time, it was not to launch, naturally, assistance, international assistance to Afghanistan, but the purpose was far more strategic and political. And I will explain to you that we have done something really concrete in Tokyo, but most important thing is that we have come out and succeeded in sending a very strategic message that both the Afghanistan, government of Afghanistan, people of Afghanistan, and the international community agreed to. And this is that Afghanistan is capable of continuing with the sustainable development of itself towards self-reliance in the next 10 years or so. That it shall continue with this economic development whose average growth rate in the past has been over 10%. Of course, it will go down with the naturally after first surge, but still that it shall continue with this development. And secondly, that it shall continue to improve the livelihood of people. And I think you must know that over the past 10 years, the GDP has, uh, <coughs> has become fivefold of what it was 10 years ago. Uh, if you look at the indicators, for instance, on public health, it's staggering. Only 9% of people had access to uh, medical institutions, now 56%, and this shall continue. And also improvement in human rights conditions, particularly the uh, rights of women and the children. And also, we have seen an increased cooperation and awareness uh, for regional cooperation and that this will be extremely important for the future development and prosperity and stability of this country. This is the first of the, the message, strategic message that this shall happen and that Afghanistan is capable of doing this in the coming 10 years. And the second of the message is that the international community had said clearly that it will continue to give support to the efforts led by Afghanistan on the vision created by Afghanistan. And this is very important that it is the vision of Afghanistan and that it is led by Afghanistan, that we only help Afghanistan in its, in its, in its effort to become peaceful, stable, self-sustaining country with democratic institutions, with rule of law, and respect for human rights, particularly for women and children. So, the intention of international community is to, to convey clearly to everybody that we shall not make the mistake, past mistake, of abandoning Afghanistan twice after, in the 90s and in the early uh, in, in the early part of this century, just after, uh, just after the, uh, we successfully toppled the Taliban regime. And I would like to stress to you that this Tokyo conference, along with the, the Chicago summit of May, is designed to send a clear message to three people. First, to the Afghan people, that we are with the Afghan people all the way through, that we support them completely. Secondly, to Taliban and the insurgents, that they cannot wait us out. If they waited, what will happen is that consolidation of peace will uh, take root with the increased capacity of Afghan uh, national security forces, and that the development of economy with the improvement of social um, uh, situation with the improvement of li livelihood will take roots. 
and that they will have no room to come in. And thirdly, to the international community, that we are all committed to maintain our assistance and work with Afghanistan. So the message is very clear on the track of security and development. And this, I'm sure you know, flows from the outcome of the Bonn meeting at the end of last year when we all um, agreed that Afghanistan will need a special assistance for another 10 years or so, what we call the transformation decade between 2015 to 24, beyond what normal countries in the similar conditions will get, that they will have an extra ass assistance for that period. In order to attain the stability of the country, we naturally need to make progress on another track, which is a political track of peace and reconciliation. But you know that this process must be owned by Afghans and must be led by the Afghans, that it must be an inclusive process. But all, we also know that this process will require the assistance and cooperation from countries in the international community and, and the region, particularly the neighboring states. And I know that Deputy Minister Rudin, Ludin here attended uh, this uh, very important meeting, which was held on the side of the Tokyo Conference called the Core Group Meeting, a meeting among Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the United States. And I have a text of their statement. <laughs> and the core part is that we are committed to work together to support an inclusive Afghan peace process through which individuals and groups break ties with international terrorism, renounce violence, and abide by the Afghanistan constitution, including its protection for rights of all women and men. So there, the Pakistan has come out in public that they support this effort. And I want to also highlight the fact that Pakistan, back in March, had openly said that it welcomes the efforts of talks among the all members of the Afghan, uh, all, all, uh, all Afghan parties for in pursuit of the peace process. We hope that this uh, process will uh, lead to a very fruitful uh, outcome, although the process will, of course, have to be cautiously be administered. And it is one of the, the important outcome of Tokyo that such meetings can take place to offer opportunity for political dialogues to proceed on the side of the main meeting. Now, Given the amount of time available, I don't want to go too much into detail of what we did. But obviously, the message that we want to send out cannot be sent out with just words. It has to be substantiated with deed. And this is what we did. So the Tokyo Declaration, for instance, does not not say that we sent a strategic message. It is the consequence of what we did that the message that, that, that I just described is there. Um, <clears throat> what the, the main, main outcome of Tokyo, what, main, um, what we have achieved substantively, substantively in Tokyo are two things. One is that we created what we call mutual agreement framework, where the government of Afghanistan will commit to uh, implement development plans which they have developed on the basis of the analysis of the World Bank, which is a very, very uh, objective analysis, and also to improve governance so that uh, whatever uh, international assistance that they may receive may be implemented with effectiveness and with transparency. And in contrast to that, we, the international community, agreed to provide assistance 
including financial assistance. And we decide, we agreed to do this in three stages. One is to, pro to commit ourselves to providing assistance in a very general manner that until 2024, the international com community will be committed in assisting Afghanistan. But in the initial stages, we shall be more concrete that until 2017, we provide assistance at or near levels of the past decade when we are very generous in terms of assistance to Afghanistan. But until 2015, that we provide a concrete sum. And as you already know, uh, the amount expressed by the international community was more than $16 billion. And in fact, uh, much more were expressed because many countries uh, had uh, made clear that they intend to provide concrete sum beyond 15. Uh, for instance, Sweden had already said that it will continue to provide assistance throughout this whole period, $1.2 billion, uh, $1 billion until 24. Um, I shall not go into the, um, what the um, details of commitment by the Afghan on the development governance, but I just want to point out that we have also created a mechanism for regular review. This is because both sides, the international community and Afghanistan, feel that commitment over such a long period have to be ascertained and be adjusted accordingly, uh, depending upon the situation of the time. And we also made it clear to the, uh, to the, uh, to the Afghan side that the international community, uh, community's ability to support, sustain uh, assistance depends upon Afghanistan de delivering on its commitment in terms of both develop, develop, development plan and also improvement in governance. On the other side, the international community also agreed that we will promise to channel our assistance through national budget up to 50%, and that 80% of our assistance should be aligned with the national development plan of Afghanistan, so that a relationship, which is, may have, may, could be termed that of donor recipient in the past, can be turned into new partnership of owner partner. So this change and also assurance that we should review the, uh, the progress made every two years at the ministerial level and at the senior official levels in between years and more regularly at the official levels will ensure that international community will maintain its attention and commitment for the next 10 years at key junctures at the political level and that it shall not simply be something that we say and leave for things to, to be uh, uh, left on its course. So this is new. So with these two concrete things, the, uh, the mutual accountability framework and the con concreteness of the commitment that, that we have made, we feel that we have been able to send this strategic message to the international community, to the Afghan people and to the Taliban. And I, uh, given the uh, time available, I would uh, uh, not go into the uh, regional, regional cooperation too much, but I would simply say that the, because I think uh, Minister Ludin, who has been uh, leading the efforts of uh, regional cooperation uh, centered around Afghanistan is here, but I will just point out that this is a very, very sensitive area as well as an important area. Uh, this has always been a major agenda of development of Afghanistan, and it is an important part of Tokyo conference, as you can see in the outcome. But we noticed that through the process, this has not been an easy process. For instance, in the first Istanbul meeting last November, we saw that not all countries were enthusiastic in coming out with the cooperation uh, at, the, uh, at the pace that might have been desirable because there are many, many overlapping efforts of regional cooperation in that area. And countries like Russia and China, who have been proceeding with their cooperation with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, were well, at, at, at the beginning somewhat skeptical of the, of the uh, initiative. 
But with the effort of people like Deputy Minister Ludin, this has changed. And I'm sure that you shall hear that from Minister Ludin. So I will close my uh, statement here. Um, but I am certain that with the cooperation of the international organization, international community, and the determined efforts of the Afghan people and the government, that we will not repeat the situation of the 90s or early this century, and that Afghanistan will become a stable and prosperous country. Thank you very much. え、山下さんありがとうございました。それでは、え、次のえ、オープニングリマークスをいただきたいと思います。今何度かお話の中に出てまいりました。アフガニスタンイスラム共和国外務副大臣のジャードルーディン様にお話をいただきたいと思います。どうぞご登壇お願いいた
Um, we had um, a good commitment, but we raised uh, four and a half billion dollars, um, a significant amount for a country like Afghanistan at the time. Uh, but even if you measured it by this one uh, 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 criteria, which is money, uh, we have moved on. Obviously, Afghanistan's needs have grown. Uh, it was a country that uh, had n nothing really by way of uh, public services, by way of uh, uh, functioning government. The only thing that the Taliban had was a, was a war machinery. Uh, uh, so I think our, our needs were modest. There's no question about it. But we, they have grown. But I think it's... Um, uh, we proved uh, uh, the uh, the naysayers and the uh, and the uh, um, uh, the pessimists wrong that actually uh, international community does have the the ability to stay the course uh, to persist uh, when there is a cause uh, that justifies that persistence and commitment. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm, as an Afghan, I'm a happy man today, uh, n but, but for reasons beyond my own country, for, for reasons that are not just, uh, just selfish as an Afghan, but actually uh, someone who really believes in, in internationalism and in, in, uh, in the agenda of uh, shared responsibility. Uh, so thank you very much. I thank Japan for being an, um, an, an um, absolutely... Uh, visionary and, and, uh, and, and committed uh, leader in the world and for, a, for being a committed and long-standing historic friend of Afghanistan. We're really proud of our, our friendship with the Japanese people, uh, a friendship that did not start 10 years ago, obviously. It's been there for uh, forever. Uh, but uh, to, to really, I, I think uh, the event yesterday was... Um, it was very encouraging. Thank you, uh, Tadamichi, once again, and, and the Japanese people. I think my, my president will be uh, speaking to the media. Um, he probably has spoken already. Uh, I don't know what time it is. Um, um, to express his gratitude, but for what's worth, I just wanted to take this opportunity before I even made, said anything to say um, a, 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 a big thank you. And, uh, and we've also heard the international community yesterday on, uh, on the question of governance in our own commitments. Uh, what Ambassador Yamamoto referred to as the, um, as the mutual accountability framework. Uh, of course, it has to be, we have to be accountable uh, to each other. I have one minute. That's so uh, uh, <laughs> unfair. Um, so I think I'll, um, it's just as well that I started talking about governance. I am being shut up. So, uh, so I'll move to the regional agenda. But just to say really that, uh, the, just to say that we, 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 have, we have heard you very loudly and clearly and, and that will be our agenda. Uh, what the president said it yesterday that he he, I think the international community has done their bit. Now it's the ball is in our court. Uh, on the agenda, I'll be very quick. Uh, but when it comes to the region, I, I will add to one of the the, the three messages that um, that Ambassador Yamamoto talked about. Um, I would add that there was a fourth message, and that was to the region. Uh, I, th I think there are elements in the region. There is no doubt that um, that have uh, uh, that have an interest in an on, in ongoing environment of insecurity and, and instability. Uh, so to, to those um, people who wanted to, uh, to wait us out um, and to, uh, to uh, test the patience of, of commitment, I think to, they got a message, a very clear message uh, in the, at the regional level. Um, and also to those who, um, uh, who need to see a different Afghanistan, who should invest in a different Afghanistan at the regional level. Um, they also got an extremely positive message yesterday by uh, saying that, in fact, uh, Afghanistan, uh, when we go through this transformation decade with your help, uh, will be transformed and it, it will be primarily the region that will benefit uh, because this, the, the, the new Afghanistan we're building will not just be a connector in terms of the economic interactions, the economic sense of uh, this region. We're not just uh, a historic crossroads. We can be actually a modern uh, land bridge. Um, 
with, uh, with the importance that, uh, that trade, transit, and all these uh, the inter economic interactions are gaining in that part of the world, uh, we, uh, we are extremely important um, in terms of our location. I would, you know, every day as part of my own job at the foreign ministry now, uh, we increasingly um, get drawn into discussions about, uh, about new linkages, new uh, transit routes. Um, I know we are, uh, by, thanks to Pakistan and Iran, who connect us to the, uh, to the Arabian Gulf and to the Persian Gulf, we are now very much exploring, in fact, the idea of um, trying to get to, uh, to the Black Sea and, and, uh, and opening up new uh, outlets that will not just benefit us, that will not just connect us to the rest of the world, but will connect the whole region. Uh, that is a vision that we have, and we, uh, we wish to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to have the region uh, really invest in that vision because it's at the end useful for them. But we also, as we, we uh, proved with the Istanbul process, uh, it's a very young process, uh, uh, but uh, already uh, very promising. It was launched last November in Istanbul uh, where the regional countries, 15 regional countries came together and, and, and talked about the agenda of confidence building. Uh, really something that was missing from this whole discussion of, uh, of regional cooperation. Uh, um, for the first time, we focused on the political aspect of regional cooperation rather than just uh, for, uh, focusing on the economic side. Uh, and, and it was uh, seven months on, we had a, an extremely successful Kabul ministerial conference on the 14th of June. Uh, and, and I think the vision there is on the political side that we can actually convene the region. We are a country that has absolutely no ambition, no agenda at the regional level and at a, in a region that really faces a lot of challenges in terms of confidence, in terms of uh, political fragmentation, trust issues. Uh, we can be a neutral, a good convener where countries can come together and discuss common challenges because we are we are not the source of terrorism, the source of drugs, the source of uh, uh, other problems that the region has, uh, but we are the worst victim of those uh, common challenges. So as, uh, we can share that experience. I know there's so much more I can say, but I would, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that I'm staying on for that uh, panel, so uh, the other things will be discussed, and I apologize that I've taken more time. But thank you so much once again uh, for this uh, a very timely event and it's really nice to talk to you this morning and once again I'm, I'm, I'm such a, a, a grateful, satisfied and not just I think uh, the word, uh, quite a modest word you used that it was a satisfactory conference. It was an enormously successful conference yesterday and they couldn't, you know, we, we Afghans just couldn't have thought of a, a better outcome than yesterday and it's not just the money.当事国から大変心温まるメッセージありがとうございました。パネルディスカッションで時間があるので、またそこで残りをぜひお話いただきたいと思います。すみません。それでは、え、3人目の方のお話をいただきたいと思います。え、国際、国連から、え、お越しい
It's funny, I only ever seem to come to Tokyo on Afghan matters. The last time I was in Tokyo <laughs> was, I, I beat you here, for a conference on Afghanistan in 1998, where the issue, uh, the Tokyo, Japan was the host, and it was at a time when, you know, there were meetings in Afghanistan every six months, and the issue then was trying to draw attention to the problems of the people of Afghanistan. And again, money wasn't the only issue, but I think we were trying to raise hundreds of millions of dollars at that time to support humanitarian and other basic services. And the government and people of Japan were enormously supportive at that time as well in a very difficult environment. So we have come such a long way. And anyone who's been to Kabul or been to any of the provincial cities or seen particularly the young people of Afghanistan, the students, the transformation over the last 15 years is truly extraordinary. And, you know, there are many, many challenges remain, but uh, we, we have really come a very long way. Let me just say that UNDP is very happy to be associated with this event. Uh, one of my many hats is as resident representative of UNDP. And the broader UN system is also privileged to have been part of the team that has worked uh, to support the government and the, uh, of, of Afghanistan and Japan to uh, make yesterday the event that it was. If I understand correctly, today is about recognizing the possibilities that this region offers. It's about opening our eyes. Uh, many of you are, 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 have been you know, involved in this a long time and looking at ways in which these possibilities can be grasped. You know, it's a region that's waiting to rediscover itself. And we need a modern rediscovery uh, of the region as a, as a, as a coherent uh, entity. Uh, obviously, it's got enormous uh, potential, whether trade, investment, economic growth, uh, and success will contribute to peace uh, and stability. Uh, I have to say, for the UN, the real yardstick, though, is going to be human development. The degree to which uh, cooperation in the region, investment, trade, contributes to improving the quality of life of the human beings, the children, the men, the women in this region. Uh, and that ultimately, for us, uh, is really what, what matters. Uh, and it is a challenge, converting investment, uh, the, the, the region's rich natural and mineral resources, the trade potential, into things that benefit people, into jobs, into livelihoods, into educational opportunities, uh, into better health. Uh, and I think this, you know, I would, I would urge all of us not to lose sight of this, that ultimately uh, I think it's about improving the quality of life of the people in the region. Um, and I'm not an expert on, you know, trade and investment in this region, but I, you know, I do, I do think we've learned a number of lessons, some of which, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to think we've, we've hauled aboard in terms of moving forward. One is it is extremely important to get the ownership of initiatives right. Uh, initiatives which are genuinely owned by the people and the countries uh, you know, involved are uh, much more likely to succeed. And in that context, I do want to commend the Heart of Asia initiative, which uh, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Ludin has been cheerleading. Uh, the political ownership of that is just terrific. Uh, Afghanistan is an agent, not a beneficiary. It is working with partners in the region to get a number of very practical things done, uh, broadening the uh, a real sense of common purpose and getting people to focus on, on what makes sense and what's realistic. He hasn't mentioned them, but there are a number of specific confidence building measures, some of which are very relevant uh, to our meeting today, including uh, in areas of chambers of commerce, uh, looking at commercial opportunities, regional infrastructure, and I would add you know, education uh, and uh, disaster risk reduction and disaster management, all of which are very important for people. Um, you know, I am biased, of course. The UN uh, is present throughout the region, but I tend to have an Afghan-centric uh, view on things. Um, 
But some of the lessons we've learned, I, I would submit just to get the conversation going, not because I necessarily have a monopoly of wisdom, is that in pursuing these initiatives, number one, we need to adopt a realistic time frame, a medium term uh, time frame at the minimum. Uh, secondly, to focus on the practical, practical and doable rather than the ideal. And in my mind, that means understanding what is already working. What is already working in terms of regional cooperation? Uh, and secondly, what is not working? Because there's an awful lot that is not working. Uh, let's be honest with ourselves. This isn't the easiest of neighborhoods. Uh, you know, it's quite a fractious, uh, uh, you know, uh, neighborhood. And we need to be very realistic about the impediments to realizing some of the ambitions uh, that we have um, and understanding why they're not working. Um, I think another lesson is rather than trying to compete or duplicate is to really try and create synergies with what's already going on in terms of international initiatives. And I get lost in the alphabet soup of organizations that are already involved in regional initiatives of one kind or another. Let me give it a shot. You know, you've got uh, not only the UN uh, with all its, uh, in all its glorious, uh, you know, variety, UNECE, UNSPECA, UNDP, agencies, funds and programs and all that. You have the Asian Development Bank, you've got the World Bank, you've got CAREC, you've got RECA, you've got SICA, you've got SARC, you've got ECHO, you've got SCO, and so on and so on. And this is great. I'm not being at all disparaging. It's terrific. But, you know, bringing synergies together and mapping out what is practical, what is working, what's not working, what initiatives are already taking place, and how these can be uh, built upon to, to achieve uh, objectives seems to me to be, you know, one way to go. So um, I'm terrified of being given the one minute uh, thing. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually going to wrap things here and simply say that I very, feel very privileged to be with such a distinguished group uh, and to have the opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, learn uh, from, from all of you uh, uh, and to wish you success and to say that uh, the UN system, uh, including uh, UNDP, but the whole UN system in the region is, uh, is on standby to support and to the degree that our competencies and capacities uh, are suitable and allow to, to, to help uh, turn some of these wonderful ideas into benefits for the people of the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. え、提示をいただきました。え、まずここからモデレーターを務めますのは渡辺恒夫東京在団上席研究員兼政策研究担当ディレクターそしてスピーカーとしましてえ、ジョンズホップキンス大学来社は東アジア研究所の県とカルダ教授ですそしてその
、そしてコメンテーターをご紹介いたしましょう。先ほどもお話しいただきました、アフガニスタン共和国外務副大臣のルーディンさんです。そして日本政府からは外務省総合外交政策局審議官の石井正文様にご登壇いただきましたそれでは渡辺さんお願いしますえっと本日はあの素晴らしいパネリストの方いらっしゃいますけれども先ほどのスピーチで多分皆さん気が疲れたと思うんですけどみな皆さんちょっと時間が足りないんでこうやって一分でもう終わりですよってやめてくださいっていうのが来てるんでみんなスピーチに残ってるんで多分日本の思い出はあの残り1分ということにならないように願っているんですがあの最初に、えー、のパネルからご紹介しますがまずその最初のパネルの第一セッションでの,あの重要なテーマの一つはです、ね、あの中央アジアの地政学ということなんですで地政学で経済学ということなんですけどこのニューシルクロードというのはどういうことかというとこれすごく重要なんでちょっと解説させていただきますと。あのアフガニスタンに対して、まあ、今度、現在もこう支援、補給活動をしているわけですけれども、この前の NATO のシカゴサミットで、2014年以降の戦闘というのをもう終了して、治安権限をアフガニスタン政府に移譲すると、こういうことになっております。ですので、あのこの間の補給、さらにはですね、軍の戦闘部隊が撤退するということでアフガニスタンから外に対する輸送路、これが極めて重要になるんです、で2つメジャーな輸送路があって、1つは中央アジアを通して、もう1つはパ,スパキスタンを通してなんです、ところがです、ね、現在、このパキスタンの輸送路はパキスタン政府の意向で止まってるんです、これはいろいろアメリカの軍事活動に対するパキスタン側の抗議という意味もどうもあるようで。と、えー、ということでいかにこの中央アジアのルートが重要かということは、これ皆さんひしひし分かっているところでございます、このあたりも含めまして、今後の,あの,この地政学というのを、今日のパネルの方には話していただくということになっております、で最初のスピーカーですけれども、もうあの最初にご紹介しました、ケント・カルダー、来社は東アジア研究所長、サイス、ジョンズ・ホップキンズ・サイスです。とカルダ先生はあのもうご存知の通り、日本政治に関しての対等でして、もう20年以上もかあのプリンストン大学で教鞭を取っておりますし、現在も日本学プログラムのディレクターもこのサイズでやっております、でさらにです、ね、CSIS ・戦略国際問題研究所の日本部長もやられておりまして、実はその時私は部下として一緒に働いてたと、そういう経験もございます。それではカルダ先生よろししくお願いします Thank you very much, Mr. Watanabe. It's a,、uh, a pleasure, as I mentioned before, to, to be here and an honor to be、uh, co sponsoring this conference with the、um, Tokyo Foundation.、Um, we've spoken a lot about Afghanistan, and of course, that ultimately is the, the heart of、uh, this、uh, session, just as、uh, it was in impressive ways、uh, yesterday.、Um, I'd like to take to start、uh, our meeting out、uh, to take the analysis just a bit broader in order to, to frame it to look at the historic changes that are occurring across、uh, Eurasia as a whole.、Um, I think we have to see them, first of all, against the,、um, the broad complementarities among nations that are geographically、uh, very close to one another. Um, within、uh, not simply Central Asia, but the Middle East,、uh, Northeast Asia, and South Asia as well.、Um, 30 years ago, we had a series of sub regions. We had nations that were,、uh, during the Cold War, very much、uh, divorced from one another in indirect conflicts, of course, in many、uh, cases. And Afghanistan, of course, was.、Uh, As has been so、uh, true over history, is, was right in the middle of a lot of that.、Um, what I'd like to do is to briefly through a, just a short series of slides, and I don't want to get the one minute mark either,、uh, to illustrate the transformation that I think is underway, the strong latent complementarities within、um, Eurasia. And uh, the, um, the ways in which、uh, transcontinental ties are deepening. 
uh, with implications clearly, as I'm sure we will see through the rest of our conference, for, for Afghanistan uh, and also for the uh, meaning and the effectiveness in the long run of the assistance that Ambassador Yamamoto and others have, have outlined that is coming from Japan. So um, perhaps to start with our, the first slide here, the nations which have the greatest energy potential, and energy is at the heart of a lot of the transformation that is potentially going to occur in Asia, uh, nations with uh, tremendous reserves and production capability are located very close, as you can see, to the uh, nations that have tremendous potential for growth. Uh, per capita uh, energy consumption in China is around one-sixth, in India roughly one-eighth to one-tenth of levels uh, it is in uh, the, the major Western nations. Um, they're growing extremely rapidly, as we know, and the producers in the Middle East and in Russia are uh, very close uh, by. Our next, next slide. Um, this geographical dimension is very important because it shows us also, of course, how central Afghanistan itself is in uh, the whole equation, uh, next to Iran, uh, next to Pakistan, uh, bordering actually uh, uh, narrowly on China. Um, the relationships, as we will see also, of course, between India and Central Asia, as uh, Professor Starr uh, uh, says very eloquently, are important and potentially developing. So you have a, a series of countries that are very close together that historically, of course, uh, had very static relations or political barriers, and those uh, patterns are rap dynamically changing. Next slide. We have to recall in that way particularly critical junctures in the last 30 years that have fundamentally changed Eurasia and caused it to become much more dynamic and interdependent than it was. China's modernizations, the Iranian revolution, India's financial reforms in the early 1990s, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the rebirth of the Central Asian states, Russia's own um, uh, reemergence as a more major player, and then, of course, Afghanistan's a transformation that uh, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Ludin, um, um, Deputy Spe Representative Keating and others, and Yamamoto son have so eloquently presented. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, if we could. Um, beyond the whole question of the critical junctures that have changed the region, of course, uh, we also have um, a deepening trans-regional ties across uh, Cold War lines. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, um, the, perhaps I, c I can simply mention uh, to you that uh, the International Energy Agency, for example, well, as we see on this slide here, uh, forecasts that energy uh, uh, exports out of the Middle East will increase 50 percent, roughly 30 million barrels a day out of the Middle East, flowing to the rest of the world. And as you can see, much of that uh, is going to be flowing into East Asia, which will also be increasing its imports. The economic relations of East Asia and the Middle East, of, Nor of Central Asia and uh, continentally neighboring nations, uh, according to most forecasts, will certainly be rising. And of course, it's not only energy on various trade dimensions and so on. The, um, those relationships will deepen. Next slide. Just very briefly, certainly developments in China will be a part of this. Energy demand is moving further to the west in China. Um, the uh, pipelines, next slide. Pipelines, of course, as we know, are increasing uh, in relation to China. China is just an example from Kazakhstan, for example, from Turkmenistan into uh, Myanmar and so on. Uh, as I say, China, the dynamic regarding uh, China certainly has begun to evolve, but what is happening across Eurasia is far broader than that. Uh, next slide. So in conclusion, growth, 
and uh, change are producing powerful resource complementarities across East Asia. It's not only energy, it's many of the other resources, many of which Afghanistan, of course, has in, in major uh, degree. Um, and the growth of the massive nations such as China and India is quite synergistic with the capabilities of other parts of the region. Critical junctures have uh, both enabled this process of interdependence and also intensified it as a result of the rapid growth uh, that's occurring um, in countries such as uh, China and India and um, other Southeast Asia. Um, rising economic interdependence, as we know. Rising um, uh, political and diplomatic uh, interdependence has been, has been so uh, eloquently attested to. Afghanistan's own potential significance. I've spoken beyond the region, but I certainly agree with everything that has been said about that importance, not only for neighboring countries, but also as a major player in world affairs for Japan. Uh, and finally, the question, the relationship of these developments on the continent of Eurasia for uh, Japan itself. In a globally interdependent world, can Japan really stand apart from that? Are there um, characteristics of uh, Japanese private sector, particularly the trading company, general trading companies that give them special skills in importing, exporting, uh, creating infrastructure investment that may in fact help to uh, intensify the dynamism across the region. These are all issues that I'm sure we will be debating and discussing further. I only wanted to uh, introduce them. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimashita. あの、ご協力に感謝いたします。えっと、お、distinguished guests, I would like to uh, focus on the simple question, how did we get here? And, and to go back to the beginning. A Afghanistan has a distinguished past. At one point it had the second or third largest city and richest city in the world. In the, in the year 10, 7, 1027, a, an Afghan scholar first calculated the circumference of the earth far more accurately than anyone had done before and then went on to project that there had to be at least two new continents between the Atlantic and Pacific and that these would be inhabitable. Uh, this was in 1027 AD. Uh, this of course came to an end, the, this great effervescence the great political effervescence at the time. It also ruled most of northern India, all of Central Asia, and the Middle East. That was all occurred. But it came to an end. And I won't go into the causes of that. But as it happened, as it happened, Afghanistan really withdrew from the world. And in the mid-18th century only was a new state created. And interestingly, this new state is today an old state, much older than all its neighbors except Iran. So people who continually worry, will it come apart? 
No one ever wanted to secede. In all the crisis that we've been through for the last 30 years, no one wanted to secede. It's a solid state in that sense. But uh, it was squeezed between three big powers, British India, Russia from the north, Iran from the side. And under this tremendous pressure for centuries, their strategy for dealing with life was to withdraw. And hence, when everyone else was building railroads, when everyone else was building continental roads, the Afghans refused to do so because they perceived it as a threat to their security. And so they, they closed the door, if you will. And then came, much later, the Soviet invasion. We forget that this led directly to the deaths of three million people. If that had occurred in Japan, it would be the equivalent of 15 million people. And proportionately much larger, twice that again, plus had it occurred in the United States. Then came a civil war. And it, hence it arrives today among the poorest, most least developed countries on the planet. And, and here we are. But what has it been achieved since the year 2001? Quite a bit, as, as we've heard. Mr. Keating understated it, if anything. Uh, and it, everyone in the room should take uh, a certain pride in what's been accomplished. But I would submit that there are two major things. First, a, the development of a new state with, a, with an admirable constitution. And second, second, the opening of the doors, both to the north and to the east. Now, Mr. Calder spoke about continental transport. I want to say about, a word about this. There are three great routes across the Eurasian landmass. There's the newest one, which was created in the 1890s across Siberia. There's the traditional China-Europe one, which goes across Ka Kazakhstan, and which immediately after the collapse of the USSR, the uh, China and the ADB working very closely got on the development of this with great success. And then there is the third great route, which was basically from Southeast Asia, India, all the way to the Middle East and Europe, exactly through Afghanistan. And we're talking now about the opening of this third great continental corridor. And uh, the, the U.S., as we will hear, I'm sure, from Mr. Pyatt at, at lunch, has taken and made a serious commitment to opening and developing this corridor. Uh, the much more important, I think, is the fact that the Afghan government itself has and really has really embraced this idea, as you can see in all their literature. But the talk tends to be about regional development. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not regional. The opportunities here are continental, involving Europe, East Asia, and everything between. Huge potential. This is, leaves Afghanistan in the role of a kind of land Suez. And think what Suez has meant in the history of of, of politics and economics. That's the role that it plays. It's, this will be an engine of development. Now, you might say this would be very nice, wouldn't it, if it existed? And someday maybe it will. But a major point I want to make is this is happening today. If you go west from Afghanistan all the way to Europe, I can identify $20 billion of real investments, real investments made or coming which are committed to op having to do with that route. If you go Afghanistan east, I can point to another $20 billion of real investments, new railroads across India, and so on and so forth. All these are decisions that have been made. They're creating tremendous pressure to solve the problem in the middle, which is Afghanistan. So I would submit this is an unstoppable force that we're dealing with. Now, how does Japan how does the, how do the United States fit into this story? Uh, for Japan, it would seem to me this has huge potential. Uh, I wonder if Japanese citizens in this room appreciate the 
amount of moral capital that your country has amassed in Central Asia and Afghanistan over the last 40 years. It's a, as a friendly observer, I can tell you it is extremely impressive. And it arises from things that have nothing to do directly with economic development. It's, it, it's real, and you've heard that already this morning. Now, how, how should this be used? Well, first, obviously, through the ADB. Uh, but the ADB does not have a program for the development of the Southern Corridor. Frankly, they have a development program for the Middle Corridor, China, Kazakhstan, West. They do not have a plan that is continental in scope for the Southern Corridor, and Japan should use its good offices to bring about such a plan. That is dramatically absent from the picture right now. Second, though, Japan seem to me might pr usefully collaborate with the United States, but also with India in the opening of this great route. Uh, this is an obvious trio. They could be very effective. Uh, the whole would be greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, now, beyond this, one can look at the 18 regional projects that were identified in Dushanbe. Uh, all having to do with trade and transport. There, there are some pretty good ones. There are some less good ones. Or you could look at the 25 investment projects that were identified in Delhi. I think the list is very weak on transport. Only three of the 25 refer, refer to transport. But it's still a good list uh, and a good starting point. Or Japan can trust its own uh, judgment on the matter, and it seems to me here there are some very interesting areas. One is borders. Japan has a proven record of expertise in the development of border facilities. And this, it is the borders rather than infrastructure that is the chief impediment to the development opening of this route. Forget infrastructure. If the borders were faster, trucks would be moving tomorrow morning. So Japan has a real contribution much bigger than it's made on that area. Second is private investment. Uh, Mr. Calder's addressed that. And here we're talking, who's going to build the trucks? Who's going to build the railroad equipment? Who's going to, to, uh, to do the freight forwarding, the, the logistics companies? Who will, who will build the storage facilities and maintain them? Who will provide other facilities, hotels? Uh, who will, who will be, whose insurance companies will cover this whole route? Well, Japan could and should be there. Uh, these are real opportunities, and, but action is needed right now. You can't wait because, frankly, decisions are being taken all over the place. So if you wait until everything is fine in Afghanistan, you'll lose the opportunity. Well, let me conclude with one uh, couple of points. This is five minutes, <laughs> uh, with, with, with a couple of points. First, we are, I think it is important to understand that this requires a continental approach. Uh, and it can't be done just locally or even regionally. The big prospects are continental. Um, and there are real problems. We shouldn't have any illusions. Uh, yesterday's remarkable performance uh, uh, was, can, doesn't hide the fact that what was achieved yesterday was filling the budgetary gap of the, of the government of Afghanistan. It did not fill the income gap of, of employees of that country. There is going to be a precipitous dropping off and it's going to happen, and it has serious implications. So what do you do in the very short term to fill that gap? And it seems to me the opening of trade. The minerals are wonderful, but that takes years. Uh, the agriculture is wonderful, but that needs transportation. What you must do tomorrow morning is open up the corridors of trade. That will start generating real income for real people to match what you have accomplished at the meeting yesterday. Now, beyond that, uh, uh, beyond that, and let me conclude with this, 
the, the situation is really far from, from hopeless. It, it, in fact, I would submit it's much better than we have heard at any stage in these meetings. Think of Korea 50 years ago, ladies and gentlemen. Korea 50 years ago was in abysmal condition, abysmal condition. It had far fewer resources than Afghanistan. Its location did not present the incredible opportunities that Afghanistan's location had. And it certainly didn't have the range and wealth of international friends and partners that Afghanistan today. I don't think it's out of the question that in 50 years we will think of Afghanistan as a kind of uh, Korea of South Korea of the 21st century. So the question then is uh, whether to act or not. This is the question American firms are going to have. This is the question that American government has to address. It, we haven't yet. We're just beginning to frame that. And it, it'll happen, I'm sure, in time. And I'm optimistic. But be sure of one thing. Whatever Japan decides on this, or Japanese firms decide, whatever U.S. decides, or U.S. firms, all this is going to happen anyway. It'll happen with or without us. The only question, will it happen better with Japanese active participation, with U.S. active participation, will it happen faster with that participation or not? And that's in our hands to decide, and it seems to me that's the great question before us. Thank you, and there's a minute left. ありがとうございました。これもあの時間もう短めにやっていただいて、残念ながら一分これ出す暇がございませんでした。えっと次はですね、コメンテーターお二人お願いいたします。最初のコメンテーターはあのジャードルーディンアフガニスタンの外務副大臣。先ほど大変素晴らしいスピーチをしていただきました。あの今度またあの十分ございますので、あので十分あの九分目に一分残ってますってきますので、あのよろしくお願いします。それでは外務副大臣よろしくお願いします。Uh, thank you, Mr. Watanabe. I really appreciate it. Uh, um, uh, the presentations are, are obviously very, very inspiring. Um, yeah, indeed, um, uh, Mr. Starr uh, spoke uh, extremely eloquently about uh, uh, about a very negative aspect of Afghan Afghan history uh, when we really missed out on on opportunity, um, and I suppose nations do miss opportunities in their histories. But um, the problem with uh, um, in our case was that we missed it at the the wrong time. Um, it was the it was the time when when. Um, when uh, the world was really transforming, when uh, when uh, there was universal literacy, there was uh, uh, there was great advancement in technology in terms of transportation, uh, and, uh, um, and at, all, at all those times in the 20th century, that was exactly the time when we um, when we blocked uh, blocked out um, the. Um, the the result was that today, um, uh, uh, when we talk about Afghanistan being a land bridge, and th this word this term was first used uh, uh, ten years ago here in Tokyo, actually, um, when President Karzai uh, came uh, and addressed that uh, Tokyo conference in 2002. Uh, in his speech, he said that the vision for Afghanistan in the region was to serve as a land bridge con connecting the region. Uh, regrettably, we in the last 10 years have, uh, have really, uh, I think all of us collectively paid uh, lip service to realization of this vision um, um, because a land bridge by definition should be, uh, should connect um, we today uh, block uh, connection. Um, it's, it's very, um, um, it's very uh, interesting and quite sad, in fact, uh, when we look at how railways, for example, uh, 
um, the networks that exist, and Mr. Starr would know much better than I do, uh, they come all the way from, from three directions. Uh, they come all the way from the, from the south and east, the uh, Indian subcontinent, they come, and they stop right, the, right at our borders. Um, and then from the north, and then that's why there are different gauges that we have, we have this big discussion now about different gauge sizes. Uh, for the future of uh, railway, uh, railways in Afghanistan. So, and they come from the north as well with a different type of gauge. Um, and then they stop right at our borders. And uh, thanks to a project, uh, an EDB project, funded project with Uzbekistan, uh, now one of those uh, lines actually has come, uh, come into Afghanistan as far as mazar sharif um, and then from the south, uh, the same happens from the west. Uh, come within Iran, the railways come and stop right at our borders. So we are this, um, rather than a, uh, um, a land bridge, we essentially when it comes to, uh, to trade and, and, and transit, we, we have been a, a blockage, a, a disconnect. Uh, um, and this is um, really, uh, not intolerable uh, only for us, uh, but I think for the whole region, particularly when, as uh, Mr. Stop put it very eloquently, when we see, uh, uh, think at the global level, but particularly at the continental level, we see a re-emergence of land um, uh, uh, transport as being very uh, important after num many centuries of obviously the maritime revolution. We are seeing it once again that, and it's not just uh, because of trade, it's because of all sorts of other modes of uh, interaction, contact, travel, uh, um, and the, uh, you know, what comes with, with globalization, uh, I suppose, makes, uh, again, land contact and land communication um, very essential, very eminent, and therefore uh, to have this situation in Afghanistan um, is, is unacceptable anymore. Uh, the reason we have not succeeded in any, taking any steps uh, in the last 10 years is I referred to very briefly earlier in my remarks about the fact that we ignored a whole dimension of the politics of regional cooperation. Uh, um, I suppose uh, essentially for, uh, for reasons of being prudent and not being not uh, uh, touching sensitivities that exist in the region uh, all the, uh, the the politics that um, that unfortunately divide this region so badly I mean this region is probably uh, in spite of all the potentials that it has is probably one of the most fragmented region uh, on the planet it's fragmented politically um, by all the the, the, uh, the, the issues that exist, and I don't have to go to them. Um, so really, when we started even, in the first regional conference was in Kabul uh, in 2002, in the year 2002, the Kabul, and then it issued the Kabul Declaration, all sorts of nice words. Um, but then since then, the whole agenda of regional cooperation was very much focused on trade, let's do trade, and let's do transit, let's, and I think trade was quite attractive because there was, with all the international money coming in and with all the international presence in Afghanistan, um, uh, the regional countries um, really capitalized on that uh, with, with um, their exports to Afghanistan from cement to bottled water. Uh, we had uh, Afghanistan flooded with um, with, with all these, uh, these exports from Pakistan, from Iran, from China, from Turkey, from India. Uh, so I think trade was, was good news uh, for the region. That's why it was essentially this um, aspect that was emphasized. And we only, I think, uh, uh, noticed the fact that it really wasn't fundamentally transforming Afghanistan if you focused uh, the regional agenda on trade. Um, we had to go to infrastructure, we had to go to investment, we had to really um, uh, describe a vision. And then when you, do, when you think about it more fundamentally, you quickly realize that, that you know, it's not easy mm -hmm. because of the politics. Uh, um, so uh, so uh, what we, uh, 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 and I'll come to the politics maybe in a minute, but just, uh, just to say that uh, 
what we really need uh, in Afghanistan to play that la land bridge role is, um, is infrastructure. What, again, was, uh, was, was so eloquently described in the, in the previous presentation, uh, we need railways uh, really badly. I think achievements have been made. The ring road is the, um, is the most important achievement. Uh, now, at least uh, when it comes to road transportation, we, don't, we are not a, a movement, a stopgap. We, uh, we connect. Uh, in, uh, if the borders, uh, as was again referred earlier, uh, the border management issues are resolved. There's some customs uh, harmonization. We, you know, technically, uh, 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 cars can and vehicles can uh, can go from Central Asia all the way to India. Uh, so the roads are okay, but um, although it's very very substandard uh, so far, but railway is an absolute must. Uh, the other thing really is that we need to. Uh, um, in, when it comes to investment in these things, there's so much that uh, ADB or public, uh, um, public investment can do. You have to really get into uh, private sector, into, uh, and that's why this uh, Delhi summit uh, um, last month, at the, at the end of last month, um, in anticipation of the Tokyo conference, was a very good event because, uh, in a sense, although it was one of many, many such conferences and gatherings, but, but it really shifted the focus from, from a trade agenda in Afghanistan to a, a, an investment agenda. And one other important, interesting concept that introduced uh, the Delhi summit was the idea of, um, of cross-country partnerships. Um, because the, other, the, the one thing that has really uh, um, been very um, absent uh, in Afghanistan is the uh, international uh, investors coming in and getting a lot, uh, having uh, um, a lot of interest in investing with security, lack of infrastructure, the energy uh, issues. These all have, I know, I know, I know. Um, these have been, um, have been big concerns. Um, so, um, but one thing is clear that if we, we do not have significant American investment in Afghanistan, unfortunately. I know ExxonMobil is interested now in some uh, uh, explorations uh, in the north, but that, that's good news. We haven't got any significant European investment. Uh, we haven't got any, in fact, Japanese investment. Uh, um, but we have now, uh, certainly in the last few years, uh, quite considerable regional investment in there with Chinese and the, in the, particularly on mineral uh, mineral resources, but hopefully increasingly in other sectors as well, in services, for example, and in, in infrastructure, we should have. Uh, but what would be useful for Afghanistan? Just just making sure. I mean, we absolutely appreciate. Let's be. Uh, le let me be clear on that. We absolutely appreciate, and we think it's very strategically important for us to have Chinese investment. There is, that's great. It's absolutely strategically important for us to have Indian investment, uh, Turkish investment, uh, and, and from other countries. Uh, but just to be, um, you know, for, in, in our move towards normalization, towards becoming a normal country and hopefully integrated in, in the global economy, we have Western, we need Western investment as well, because it's, it's I think an, a, an economy needs uh, credibility uh, as much as anything else. Uh, so we need, just to be credible, we need, um, we need that investment and perhaps this whole, the whole, this whole model of cross-country partnerships where international companies can come and partner with regional or Afghan uh, enterprises in setting up businesses and investing is, is, a, is a good model. Um, and just maybe a quick word on, uh, on the politics of this whole thing, just to say that, uh, that we uh, really think this Istanbul process um, has, a, has, a, uh, has a lot of promi promise. Uh, for, 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 for once, really, and um, uh, it was possible for us uh, in Afghanistan to really confront the region uh, with some of the uh, the challenges that that are absolutely shared, I mentioned it very briefly earlier when I said that Afghanistan, uh, we don't see us, uh, and it has been a, a view that has been proven wrong now, uh, 
that we are not the source of uh, terrorism, let's be sure. I mean, these, these the, the, the Taliban guys, the Al-Qaeda, the, these people were imposed on us. And even to, to this day, they come from across our borders to attack us. Uh, Afghanistan has never been um, um, the source of this. It was made a haven uh, for terrorism, uh, and that's what probably they would want to try to achieve. Uh, so we were, if anything, we were a victim, the, the, the worst victim of this terrorism, in the same way that, you know, have some of the other challenges. And what it says is that these things are, are, are shared challenges, that this region, whether we like it or not, in one way or another, either as, as contributors in a way or, 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 uh, or victims, uh, we are affected by some of the security concerns we have some of the socio-economic concerns we have. Refugees, for example, I mean, we, that's, uh, that I agree, we've been uh, perhaps the biggest source of refugee, uh, uh, refugee movement in the region, to Iran and to Pakistan, but also to, to the rest of the world. Uh, but the, and drugs is an important issue. Uh, and now the only thing is really for, for us to accept that there is a shared responsibility, that the region should not, like they have done in the past uh, number of years, think about Afghanistan as an issue, as, a, as an object. Uh, Afghanistan uh, must stop being the object of, of conferences um, and discussions and, uh, and debates uh, Afghanistan should be an, an agent. Uh, we, we wish that to be because we have a view apart from being a, uh, I think being a challenge, uh, a, a challenging environment, we also have our own view about these things. So that's really the essence of the Istanbul process. And if we can gather, uh, generate enough uh, interest, which we have now, I mean luckily, uh, we were very concerned, as, as I think Ambassador Yamamoto mentioned in his remarks, um, at the beginning of the Istanbul process, um, seven, eight months ago in Istanbul, um, we were very concerned if this thing would really take off, uh, because obviously uh, Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan, all these big countries, they have their own very established uh, points of view about security issues, about other issues. Uh, so to then uh, confront them with a new type of agenda or the new process is not easy. But then we were, uh, we, uh, we were very grateful, in fact, very, very encouraged that this, uh, the ministerial that we held in Kabul, which was a follow-up to Istanbul, uh, was very well attended uh, and, and it came out extremely successfully. So that's, uh, that's a process that will significantly contribute in, uh, to and, and, and complement the regional economic uh, agenda, and I will stop there. Thank you very much. ルーディン副大臣、ありがとうございました。あのご紹介をきちんと最初にしなかったんですけども、ルーディン副大臣は副大臣の前はカナダ中カナダ大使、大統領報道官、大統領主席報道官を歴任されてますし、英国ではあの人道支援、開発、紛争解決、こ,この分野での専門家でございます。あのそれではあの日本の方からコメンテーターあの外務省の総合政策局の審議官石井正文さんお願いいたしますあの過去にも東京財団フォーラムには何度かご登壇いただいておりますが英国の日本大使館の講師米国の日本大使館講師などを歴任されておりますそれでは石井さんお願いします渡辺さんどうもありがとうございます外務,外務省の石井です2、えー、人のプロフェッサーとそれから外務副大臣の後にしゃべるのはちょっと気が重いんですけれどもあの私はかつ中央アジアに関してはあのアマチュアですあのただあのアマチュアの立場からこの今日のシンポジウムのシルクロードニューシルクロードにあのという視点から、えー、コメントをさせていただきたいと思いますそれから私は多分唯一のポリシーメーカーこの中ではあの、まあ、あの偉い方を除いてですねあのえっと、非常に低いレベルのポリシーメーカーですのでそういう観点からもお話をさせていただければと思います、えー、新大陸主義とニューシルクロードあのこの2つの概念は日本は大賛成ですあのそれは非常にいくつかの重要な視点を日本も従来からシェアしているからですそれ一つはあの母さんおっしゃ,あのおっ,しゃったようにスターさんおっしゃったように、えー、コンチネンタル要するに大陸の連結性を強める
というのが重要な視点だと思いますしそれを経済の相互依存を通じてやる経済の相互依存を高めると世界は安定するという考え方でやるとこの2つの視点は日本は全く賛成してます実はあの大体において日本のイニシアティブというのはいつも遅く出てくるんですけども中央アジアについては結構日本は先見の明がありますあのソビエトソ連が崩壊したのを皆さんご存知のように91年の12月ですがもうその翌月92年の1月には日本は中央アジアの国と国交を回復してそれから大使館も日本のシステムでは驚くほど早くその1年後にカザフスタンとキルギスに開設していますそれ次,に次の節目は97年7月ですけれども当時の橋本総理大臣ユーラジアディプロマシーあのユーラシア外交というのを打ち出しましたこれも皆さん覚えておられないかもしれませんがあの私この時ちょっと関わってたもんですから覚えてるんですけどもあの最初に橋本総理から提案のあったスピーチのユーラジアディプロマシーのエレメンツは中国とロシアだけだったんです。でまあ、もう喋ってもいいと思いますけど外務省の方で実はセントラルアジアもありますよということでシルクロードってどうですかという提案を差し上げて橋本総理は非常に偉かったのはそれ面白いねと言われてあのその三本柱になったとその頃からあの私ども中央アジアって結構いろいろ日本ができることあるんじゃないかというふうに思っておりましたで2004年には初めて日本は中央アジアと日本という外相レベルの会合を始めてますこれも宣伝不足で皆さんご存知ないかもしれませんが実は今年秋には4回目の中央アジアと日本の外相会合をやる予定ですで一番最近では2009年当時の麻生総理が現代版シルクロード構想というのをこれまた打ち出しておりますということで実はこの言葉って結構日本が相当今まで使ってきた言葉でありますでじゃあそれを通じて日本はどういう視点を持っていたかということを申し上げますともちろんあの中央アジアは豊富なあの天然資源ありますあのカルダ教授がおっしゃった通りですただあの実はモテる国ばかりではないのであのそれも重要ですけどもそれだけではないやはり日本にとって重要なのはこの地域が持つ地政学的な重要性それはやっぱり歴史上ソ連ロシアそれから中国と交流しながら生きてきたというこの中央アジアの地政学的な重要性だと思いますで日本はそういう意味でこのような中央アジアの国が独立して開かれて開かれてっていう意味はより分かりやすく言えば特定の国の勢力圏に入らないってことですけれどもそれから安定して繁栄するインディペンデント・オープン・ステーブル・アンド・プロスプラスということを言ってきましたけれどもこ,のこれは日本にとっても重要だと。この中央アジアが不安定化すること今申し上げた4つの状況から離れるということは大陸全体の不安定化につながるとそういうことでございますでもう一つの視点は先ほどあのスター教授おっしゃいましたけれども政治的野心とか、まあ、過去のしがらみっていうのは日本はないんですねやっぱりモラルグラウンドがあると思いますしたがってそういう意味から重要な役割を果たせるんじゃないかとこの2つの視点から日本は中央アジアに関与してきたんだと思いますもちろん政治的なしがらみがないというのはパワーがないということにもつながるので必ずしもそれがいいかというのはありますけれどもまあ中央アジアに関しては非常に入り口としては良かったのだろうと思いますその上でまああとはあの外務省のホームページを見ていただければ分かりますけれども5つの協力分野であったり3つの指針だったりそれにもついて具体的な協力の行動計画というのをすでに作っておりますまあこれはもうあとは細かい話なんであのそ,のそれを申し上げた上で今まで3人の方のお話を伺って私として5つぐらいちょっと簡単にコメントをしたいと思います一つはあのやっぱりアフガニスタンの安定性というのは地域全体の安定のための必要条件ではあるけれども十分条件ではないということですあのまあアフガニスタンなんて非常に重要ですけれども全体の十分条件ではないで先ほどからおっしゃってたようにやっぱりアフガニスタンは地域のためにいろいろこれから行動されるというのは非常に重要ですし今までは地域がアフガニスタンのためにいろんなことをやってきたわけですけれどもアフガニスタンはこれから地域の安定のために行動される十分な能力があるんじゃないかと思います。で
東京会合はそういう、まあ、スピリットであの開かれた会合でもあると思いますで、まあ、同時に申し上げたいのはあのあのアメリカの継続的なコミットメントはこれはクルーシャルに重要だということですこれはあのア,メリアメリカの,あの治安部隊というのはアフガニスタンから引かれるかもしれませんがこれはこれからの新しいアメリカのコミットメントの始まりだというふうに僕らは思っていますそれぐらいアメリカのコミットメントは引き続き重要だと思います、まあ、あの要はアフガニスタン撤退は終わりではなく始まりであるというふうに考えたいと思います二つ目に申し上げたのは申し上げたいのはあの今もいろいろ議論ありましたけれども地域の主要国との政治的な関係の安定経済的な関係はもちろん重要ですけれども地域の主要国との政治的な関係の安定というのは絶対避けて通れない課題だということですあのそれで先ほど副大臣先ほどから副大臣がおっしゃっているように地域の国の間で信頼情勢コンフィデンスビルディングメジャーのための会合が行われるとテルというのは非常にいいことだと思いますで当然ロシアと中国との関係これは非常に重要です、えー、先ほどあのどちらかおっしゃったと思いますがインドの役割というのはこれからますます重要になると思いますあの日本とアメリカとインドの3カ国の政府の間での協議の枠組みがありますすでに2回目の会合を東京で5月に行っています3回目は今年が終わる前にあのニューデリーでやる予定ですでこの協議では必ず中央アジアの問題アフガニスタンの問題は議論することになると思いますで,そでもそれだけではなくて今日はあまり議論ありませんでしたが実は、えー、パキスタンとの関係これはやっぱりどうしても避けて通れないさらに言えばイランとの関係このパキスタンとイランというその中央アジアの国と国境を接してかつアフガニスタンを包み込んでいるこの2つの国との関係を何とかしないとおそらく今後何をやってもうまく進まないんだろうと思いますあの非常に難しい課題だと思いますけれどもあの今日はあまり議論にはなりませんでしたので問題提起だけしておきたいと思います、えー、3点目、えー、地域の関係が重要だと申し上げましたけれども同時にやっぱり開かれたステータス日本から見るとこの地域が開かれたステータスを維持しているというのは非常に重要なことですでこういうあのこの中で先ほどから議論ありましたがいろんな地域的な枠組み上海条約機構であったりいろんな枠組みがありますこれに対してその外の国日本でありアメリカがどう関与していくのかというのは実は今まであまり十分あの関与できてない面がありますここはあの今後の検討課題としてよくよく特に上海,を行い上,上海条約機構上海協力機構との関係をどうしていくかというのはこれからより具体的に考えなきゃいけない問題だと思います4番目、えー地域全体とかコンチネンタルとか申し上げましたけれども実は個別の国を見るとあの専門家の方よ,よくお分かりですけれどもすごくいろんな国があります資源がたくさんあって人口が多い国もあれば資源が全然なくて人口が少なくて非常に貧しい国もありますですから地域全体のかさ上げも重要なんですけれどもあのそれぞれの国に対してテーラーメイドの協力というのが非常に重要になってくると思いますテラーメイドの協力の中では例えばやっぱり非常に貧しい国っていうのはそれこそ最近話題になっています脆弱国家になり,なり得る国ですでそういう国との間では実はあのやっぱり日本の強いところあの国境管理この面での協力っていうのはこれからますます重要になると思いますあの私スターさんがおっしゃったこと大賛成です最後5点目、えーまあ、あの世の中いろいろ動いてますからあのどんどん新しいプロジェクトみんなのためになるような新しいプロジェクトを作っていって協力を活性化させていったらいいと思いますあのどなたかおっしゃいましたが日本にとって特に今年の中央アジア日本外相会合の重要なアジェンダの一つはやっぱり災害です災害への対処それは中央アジアはあの地震がたくさんある国ですあの日本が今回経験したことを中央アジアの人との間で十分議論していく予定ですし、具体的ないろんな協力も今後できるんじゃないかと思います。であのそういうことであの私は今回あのいろんな皆さんからあの政策のにあのなりそうなあのヒントをいただいてそれを持って帰るというのが仕事ですのでどうもありがとうございました。
石井さんありがとうございましたそれではですねあの残りを質疑に会場からの質疑に当てたいと思いますあの各自皆さん質問あるでしょうけどもなるべく短めに、えー、お名前と所属をお名乗りいただいて、えー、お願いいたしますあのマイクが通,通訳がありますからマイクがいかないと通訳できませんのでえっ、ー、と挙手をさ,されてそこにマイクがいきますじゃあマイクそちらの方に今行きます少々お待ちください Uh, <coughs> my name is Sadaki Numata. I was ambassador to Pakistan at the time of 9 11. And after that, I was ambassador to Canada before you got there. <laughs> But uh, uh, my question relates to Pakistan. I was、uh, encouraged to hear from Ambassador Yamamoto about this core group meeting in which Pakistan participated and came out openly in support of、uh, Afghanistan.、Uh, But to what extent do you think? Pakistan's cooperation might be, how shall I put it, contingent upon in internal developments in that country. And、uh, a related question to Dr. Starr how does Pakistan figure into your scheme of the third corridor? Thank you very much. So, first of all, I'll ask you. Ambassador, thank you so much、uh, for, that, um, for that question. In fact, it's, a, it's a very, another very important aspect of the, that political environment that I was talking about. In fact, with the, um, um, uh, as um, we move towards 2014, and,、um, in, and now that the, the agenda is very clear, that、uh, military. Presence of, the, of NATO and ISAF forces will be withdrawn.、Um, we will take responsibility. The process will continue. The partnership with the international community will continue. However, the most important thing that we need to now focus on、uh, strategically is to make sure that the level of threat that we face. Uh, comes down, that, and in that we can only achieve through. The peace process. And when it comes to the peace process,、uh, the role of Pakistan is absolutely vital.、Uh, we, have, we, we will need support from several of the regional countries to facilitate、um, the process.、Uh, we are already talking to Saudi Arabia, to Turkey, to、uh, United Arab Emirates, to several of other, in, in whatever way they can help this process, they will. Uh, but as we have said it before, it's,、um, all of these roads go through,、uh, go through Pakistan. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, uh, we will engage with Pakistan bilaterally, essentially, and that's why President Karzai went there.、Um, I mean, we have been there a number of times, really,、uh, numerous times. But the last time was last February, when, uh, after which uh, the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Prime Minister Gilani, announced. That Pakistan publicly announced that Pakistan was supporting the peace process and called on the Taliban to join. We would have liked that to have been followed by, by some action because,、um, you know, in, in today's world、uh, with media uh, uh, the way it is,、um, a statement doesn't really go very far if it's not、uh, sustained then by action. Unfortunately, we, we didn't because.、Um, You know, things quickly changed、uh, within Pakistan. And, and now we are we're looking forward to the visit by the new Prime Minister of Pakistan, Prime Minister Ashraf, to、uh, Kabul next week, in fact.、Uh, so hopefully,、uh, here we will be able to follow up on, on that statement and on、uh, further actions that are required.、Uh, we work with them on this、uh, trilaterally as well and the, this core group meeting that was held yesterday is part of that process to see if we can together with the United States and Pakistan if we can take this agenda forward but it's really、uh, to really、uh, focus on the question you asked about whether it's influenced by internal、uh, arrangements in Pakistan it's absolutely、uh, there is no question about it there is、uh, we have a pretty good Um, understanding with the civilian uh, uh, government in Pakistan, I think they understand our concerns.、Uh, some of them share our concerns the way we have it.、Uh, 
but then uh, but then we believe there are elements uh, in the Pakistani uh, military who need to be convinced that this is the right thing to do for not just for Afghanistan's security but also for Pakistan's future stability and in the wider regions and those elements uh, we believe have not yet been convinced so the like to address the second part of your question Mr. Ambassador, I think the Afghan-Pakistan border is the single greatest impediment to continental trade on the southern route. And if it were open tomorrow, I can promise you by tomorrow afternoon, trucks would be going from Hanoi to Hamburg. So the question, how do you, how do you remove this cork? Uh, it may seem naive given the record and given the history. But uh, two things. First, uh, very significant, I think much more significant than we've acknowledged, is the Afghan-Pakistan Transport and Trade Agreement. This is a very good document. Uh, it has not been implemented at all. On the other hand, it seems to me this is an obvious focus of the the main, should be the main focus of anyone interested in opening up these corridors of transport. Is there any hope of it? Well, I, I am more optimistic on this because I've been following very closely the India-Pakistan border. Last year, across that border, there, which is nominally closed, uh, there was five billion dollars of legal transport. There was something around, and the figures vary, somewhere from 8 to $12 billion of what they call unregistered transport across that border. Doesn't mean that they're, that they're taking trucks of drugs across. It just means that these are crossing on the route up to Lahore where there's not an adequate uh, station for registering them. Now, there have been me major meetings of, Afghan, uh, of Pakistani and Indian businessmen on both sides of the border. And in spite of all the intransigence in Islamabad, the, it's my understanding that the 17 members of the uh, Af fairly new Afghanistan Business Council, which is the 17 largest firms in the country, that they, that they support this, tra this, this continental transport because they realize it will be a money machine for them, too. それでは他に質問はございますか。それでは今マイクが参りますので、お待ちください。マイクお願いします。私あの共同通信の杉田と申します。皆さんどうもありがとうございます。あの先ほどあの石井さんのあのコメントの中でアメリカのクリシャルコ
Um, if the things that have been said today about progress and about economic dynamism and so on were uh, better understood, I think that the um, uh, su support will be, would be stronger. I, I think fundamentally it's, it is there uh, in the, um, the fact that, that we have committed ourselves for so long and because of the nature, its origins in both terrorism and but then the kind of progress that has been made uh, since. And I think the United States also, speaking as someone outside the government but who has spent time, also the, the Japan's uh, contribution is, is deeply appreciated. That said, going forward, certainly given our financial situation and so on, I mean, the adjustments beyond 2014, of course, take those things into account. Um, our allies and uh, nations around the world, uh, I think most Americans feel, will certainly become an increasingly important part of this. A very quick note. Uh, we'll hear, I think, probably over lunch, uh, on this subject, uh, and I defer to our speaker. However, uh, my impression is that for the past few years, the U.S. publicly at home has emphasized what it's not doing in Central, uh, in, in Afghanistan, and what it is ceasing to do in Afghanistan, rather than what we are doing and what, is, what has been achieved from it. Uh, in other words, it's not a financial crisis, Merely, it is a leadership crisis to defend what we have done for 10 years at great cost in lives and in, and in treasure and to do this publicly and not apologize for it and not run. Uh, I suspect we've turned a corner. Maybe even this meeting yesterday symbolizes that in which we will be able to talk a little more candidly to our fellow Americans about what is being accomplished, what has been achieved, and what can be achieved in the future. This is a problem not of money as merely, but of leadership. あの、あの、で、が将来NHK
Well, my name is Yuki Onogi. I am a master's candidate at SAIS. Um, my question is about the, well, the TAPI pipeline going through Afghanistan eventually. So I want to ask you about the US and Japan's view on the TAPI pipeline and its project. So, Um, if, did I understand the question correctly that it was about the radio uh, T, uh, RTA, which we call the, con the fact that Japan um, um, helped uh, build the RTA at the, uh, at the beginning, and then, and, and then I think after when. Obviously, after all the uh, the turmoils in 2001, when we first came, and there was this one t uh, radio television uh, station, um, I uh, remember that the uh, Japanese assistance was was uh, very critical in in restarting it. Uh, the equipment that was provided and also the um, uh, the uh, facilities were rebuilt and it was able to start um, start its function within a very short time frame um, so I'm, I'm, that's one really important aspect of uh, of Japanese contribution there there are many obviously we uh, anyone who travels out of yeah yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. So, um, as I was saying, anyone who travels out of Kabul or into Kabul will see the, the terminal uh, building as well, and so many other examples of, of contribution, but that was one uh, useful one. Um, but since then, that was in 2001, there was that one uh, TV channel uh, that uh, we had. Uh, today, there are, it's very difficult to really keep Keep um, keep track, but some anywhere between 30 to 35 uh, TV stations that broadcast. And except for this one, that's a government channel, the rest are all uh, free uh, uh, media. That's been uh, one of the uh, the extremely important achievements, and something that makes us quite uh, quite different, I think, uh, from some of the other regional countries. Not all of them. I think there's free media does have some uh, some presence in in some uh, part of that region. But we are really proud of our progress on that front, and it's uh, it's it's been one um, really uh, strong and powerful. Um, uh, way for for public to 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 express their views, and it's been uh, despite all the challenges that uh, that uh, true media freedom presents to a new uh, country, a new uh, in in the sense in a new government, a new democracy, uh, we have maintained it in in uh, so far, and um, we look forward to that. Um, to further strengthening it. I think it has to be uh, strengthened, institutionalized, but we are we're really proud that it has been maintained. ありがとうございます。じゃあ、スターさんお願いします。あの、あの、難しいと思いますが、今おあの、The TAPI pipeline is of first level strategic importance to all participating countries. For Turkmenistan, it is an alternative, another alternative uh, to Gazprom. And it is extremely important to them. They they have no they have pressed for without any uh, intermission 
from the early 90s. And as a result, in, to, in promoting it, they've produced more. I think only India has more uh, consulates around Afghanistan than the Turkmen do. Um, and Pakistan has also taken a consistent interest in this. Uh, the U.S. Uh, pushed very hard for it back in the 90s and then cooled to the idea. A lot of the people who were involved with it, frankly, got tired of the project because it seemed to be going nowhere. Uh, today, uh, things have changed. Uh, the, the Turkmen received a proposal from Chevron uh, a couple of months ago, and um, it was to become the principal developer of this pipeline. Uh, it was supported by the Secretary of State, which was essential, but not sufficient uh, in that the Turkmen had noticed that there had been statements from one part of the government about this, but none from the White House or National Security Council. And so I believe they interpreted this as, as a kind of qualified support. And so far, they have not acted on it. And uh, however, the fact that they got this far is, is I think, a, a credit to all the parties concerned. And that means, in this case, uh, the government of Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, the United States, and Chevron. Um, now, th this is far from dead. Uh, uh, it, it, it is, however, actively opposed with, uh, uh, by another pipeline project, and that is from India, uh, I'm sorry, from Iran to directly to Pakistan through Balochistan, which is not a place I'd want to build a pipeline. Uh, that project has been actively promoted by Russia uh, because it did, first it, it prevented Turkmenistan from getting its, getting its gas out independently of Russia, and second because they didn't want to do us any particular favors in Afghanistan. So uh, that's where things stand. I think, uh, I think there are very good reason to be optimistic about this. I, what has been missing, I think that the, the, the this has such an aura of big power games to it that the governments of Turkmenistan and Afghanistan, perhaps not Pakistan and India, but the first two, have been uh, perhaps more passive than would be desirable. I think it, it, we've finally reached the point where initiatives from their side will probably uh, push it over the top. I just wanted to say in conclusion, we've heard this throughout this panel, the, uh, the dynamism, certainly the, the complexity um, of the uh, dynamics surrounding Afghanistan, but also the, the possibilities as continentalism um, becomes more, and continental interdependence becomes more uh, intense. And uh, it's certainly for uh, Japan, for the United States, uh, for the world, something that we have to be looking at much more carefully. ありがとうございました。ちょっと時間オーバーしてしまいました。あの、一つ宣伝をさせてください。あの、このアフガニスタンを囲むこのユーラシアの複雑な地政学ってなかなか日本でも情報が少ないと思いますが、東京財伝